Right now on KCCI 8 News Close Up, from being sworn in as the state's youngest governor to eventually becoming the longest serving governor in U.S. history, you could say that Terry Branstad has seen it all. Next, we'll talk to the governor about how he got started in politics, leading the state through the farm crisis of the 80s, and what the future may hold for the man from Leland. Close Up starts right now. This is Iowa's news leader. This is KCCI 8 News Close Up. Good morning and thanks for joining us. The milestone kind of snuck up on all of us. But when the news spread that Governor Branstad was making history by becoming the nation's longest serving governor, the well wishers came out in droves. And when the record became official, I had a chance to talk to the governor about the big day. Inside the governor's reception room. Congratulations, Governor. Tyler Ackerson. Yeah, good to see you. The governor spent the day receiving. Hi, how are you? After giving a lifetime of service. I was 35 when I was elected, 36 when I took office. At age 69 now, that's 7,642 days in office to be exact. Youngest lieutenant governor, youngest governor, longest serving governor, oldest governor. <laughs> and now the longest serving governor in American history. Terry Branstad now breaks a record that stood 200 years. Do you ever dream of this? No, no. <laughs> Serve this long? No, I never imagined this could happen. But you work hard every day and great things can happen. I, Terry E. Branstad. It all started back in 1983. Four terms later, Branstad took a break to become president of DMU. Terry but the e. comeback Branstad. kid came you back to the Capitol four years ago. Swear. Having led Iowa from the farm crisis of the 80s to a much more diversified, prosperous economy, young people, when I first came into office, were leaving the state. Now in his record sixth term. We've come a long ways. We're now third best managed state. We're sixth lowest in unemployment. Looking back, he tells me his oh, top yeah. three highlights meeting Pope John Paul II, befriending Chinese President Xi Jinping, Jesus and seeing the state through the floods of 93. When the going get tough, the tough get going. And I think in Iowa, we've got a lot of tough people that are very resilient. And it's been an honor to serve them. While we were there, Branstead took a congratulatory call from former President George H.W. Bush. The Iowa boy says he feels honored to make history today, but he's already thinking about the goals he hopes to achieve tomorrow. And we are joined now on Close Up with the nation's longest serving governor, Terry Branstead. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Cynthia. Coming in. And Glad to be with you. Congratulations, yeah. by the way. Thank you. After Thank all you. these years. Well, it's a great honor, and I'm really proud to serve the people of Iowa. This is a great state. I love the state. I go to every county every year, meet a lot of wonderful people, and I always say we're not done yet. we got a lot more we want to accomplish in the next three years. Yeah, going to county, the, the presidential candidates call it the full grassy. We should call it the full Branson because <laughs> you've been to each county about 35 times, I right, heard. Right. Well, <laughs> Grassley started even before I did, so I've got to give him credit. But uh, I, it's a great way to stay in touch with people and to learn what's going on. And it's just a lot of fun, and there's just a lot of wonderful people in Iowa. And uh, I grew up on the... Minnesota border, small mm -hmm. rural county, and we never used to see the governor. And so, w when I got elected governor, I said, I want to go to every. I want people to know. People in our county used to say, Well, they think we're part of Minnesota, and I said, nah, I want them to know that we're part of Iowa, and the governor knows and cares about people in every county and listens to them. Right, you're a Listen, big listener. That's important. If you're going to be a good leader, you got to be a good listener, and the way you learn how to do. What needs to be done to serve people is to listen to their concerns. And let's go back to you growing up. And you told a story the other night about growing up on the farm and how you really learned your work ethic, waking up at 5.30 in the morning. Right. Well, it was tough times. Uh, we had a severe drought when I was in about sixth grade. My parents both worked at the packing plant in Elbert Lee, Minnesota, so they left real early. So it was my responsibility to do the chores. And we had a lot... We had chickens and pigs and cattle and sheep, and we had ewes coming in with baby lambs in the middle of winter. And so I would get up and see what ewes had baby lambs, and I'd get them in the pen, nurse the lamb nursing with a heat lamp uh, before I went to school. I saved a lot of lambs, but I was late for school a number of times. <laughs> uh, but I learned a lot of responsibility in an early age, learned to work very hard, and I had a lot of responsibility. And 
I think that work ethic has served me very well. And you still wake up early and do a lot of work before the sun comes up. And every success story has a beginning. What are your earliest memories of wanting to serve? Well, I had these great teachers in Forest City. I, I, went, I grew up at Leland. Uh, we were part of the Forest City school system. So in eighth grade, we went to Forest City. And I had Lura Seawick, my eighth grade U.S. history teacher, and Fred Smith, my Iowa history and civics teacher. Lyra Seawick taught the three R's of good government, rights. We all know about the Bill of Rights. But she also taught respect for other people and their rights and responsibility to be a good citizen, actively participate, obey the laws, and all of that. And I think any student that ever had her could, could recite the three R's of good government. She was an unforgettable uh, teacher, too, because uh, just like the beautiful dress you're wearing, she loved purple. And she wore purple. And she had one blue eye and one brown eye. <laughs> so for an eighth grader, you never forget somebody like that. Exactly. And she was, she loved America, and she loved, and she was just inspirational. So from there on, I said, I want to go into a career of public service. Fred Smith, who was the Iowa history teacher, took us to the courthouse. We did a mock trial, and I was one of the plaintiff's attorneys in that exercise. And I think that's probably why I went on to law school in preparation for a career of public service. And you have said, uh, speaking of inspiration, your mother gave you the best advice along the way in politics. What was that? Well, my mother, uh, I had a Jewish mother, and she was pretty outspoken. I mean, at the ball games, she used to ride the umpires. So, <laughs> and she, uh, but she used to say, get a good education because they can't take that away from you. And I think that came from her Jewish heritage. And, and I always... Even when I ran for the legislature when I was still in law school, I promised my mother, I will finish law school, I'll work it between legislative sessions, and I did. And, and she, she was a Democrat, but she changed and helped and, <laughs> and voted for me and even painted signs for me when I ran for the legislature in 72. And she told you, don't take any vote for granted. You have to go out there and ask for a vote. That's right. She told me about one gentleman in, in my hometown of Leland, and she's he won't vote for you unless you specifically ask for it. So I learned not only go door to door, but also to humbly request and ask for the vote. So as a candidate, uh, it's important to meet the people, but you don't want to be bashful about asking for their vote. So, uh, yeah, that's one of the great pieces of advice that she gave me was don't be afraid to ask for the vote. And a lot of people might not know, you served in the military, you were drafted into the Army in 1969 to 71, and yep. you were in the military police, and you played a role in arresting actress Jane Fonda. I didn't know that. Well, yeah, I was the Provost Marshal's driver. He was a full bird colonel and head of the military police at Fort Bragg, and I would drive him to these general, uh, the general that was in charge had a, a weekly meeting with the, with the top uh, 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 military people at Fort Bragg, and on the way back from one of those meetings, he told me they're getting pressure from some congressmen uh, to let Jane Fonda on the post. I said, that doesn't make any sense, and these congressmen that are trying to pressure you, they don't support the military anyway. I gave them 19 pages of documentation why they shouldn't. Uh, they voted not to let her on the post. She came on the post illegally anyway, and my unit, the 503rd Military Police Battalion, arrested her. So wow. I played a role. I'm not the one that actually <laughs> made the arrest, okay. but I put the documentation together for it, and I was there with the colonel to witness uh, the 503rd Military Police arrest Jane Fonda. So uh, I had an interesting experience, and I enjoyed my time in the military. I used to have to uh, talk some of my buddies into uh, uh, going up to watch the North Carolina legislature in Raleigh on Monday night. I had a 65 Ford convertible, so I had a car, and most of the other guys didn't. So uh, <laughs> even though I wasn't from North Carolina, I had enough interest in government that I loved to go up on Monday night and watch the North Carolina I'm, legislature. I'm sure you were the only soldier doing that <laughs> at the time. That says a lot. Well, when Close Up continues, we'll hear more of Governor Branstad's stories. We go back to 1983, when a 36-year-old is first elected governor and inherits an ag economy mired in crisis. What it took to turn it all around, next on Close Up.
And looking at the galleries today, I can see many of these people are here. And looking at the galleries today, I can see many of these people are here to share those concerns with us. My heart goes out to the families who have lost their farms. Now many people remember the 1980s as a time of materialism and prosperity, but not if you were an Iowa farmer. For us, it was a time of enormously high interest rates, plummeting land values, and thousands of hardworking family farmers forced into bankruptcy. And we are with Governor Branstad this morning. Welcome back to Close Up. Terry Branstad, the longest serving governor in U.S. history, and we're here looking back. And when you were first elected back in 1983, you were just 36 years old. Right. Unemployment was over 8%. Iowa farmers were dealing with an economic crisis. Did it feel overwhelming, and what steps did you take to turn it around? Well, it really was the worst of times, and the good news is we were able to start bringing the unemployment rate down, and we were focused on economic development, diversifying the economy, adding value to agriculture. But to deal with the stress in agriculture, land values were dropping. Banks, we closed 38 banks. Land values dropped 63 percent during my first term. We put together the Farmer Lender Mediation Service. We started the Rural Concern Hotline, which we started in 1985 and is still in existence to help families that are going through stressful times. Anna and I worked to get uh, the national government to restructure agricultural debt like the farm credit system. In fact, I lobbied, I, I found out the other night uh, some of the items in President Reagan's uh, diary about. Uh, how strongly I was advocating on behalf of Iowa farmers. And I'm proud that I did that. Wow. And, and, you know, a lot of people lost their farms. We went through some difficult times. But we saved a lot of farms, and we did a lot to diversify the economy. And we started renewable energy. And now Iowa has produces more ethanol from corn than we use in gasoline. So we've come a long ways, and the things that we did back in the farm crisis in the 80s have made Iowa a more diversified and prosperous state. Made a big difference today. And how big of a difference and how big of a factor was it when President Carter halted the grain shipments um, after uh, the Soviet Union? That was in 1980 in response to the invasion of Afghanistan. Well, that was devastating because it cut off uh, a great market for Iowa farmers. I actually went on a trade mission to Hungary and I was on uh, a grain, a, 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 a corn research facility and had dinner with a family there, and I asked uh, this a PhD in, in corn research uh, who was the greatest American president. He said, uh, Jimmy Carter. And, and I said, why? He said, because the grain embargo was great for Hungary because it cut off the American corn, and so the Soviets had to buy it from us, and we really cleaned up. I said, so it shows, depends upon your perspective. It was terrible for Iowa, and it really hurt our farmers. And it, you know, began kind of the beginning of the farm crisis, and it was that. And then, then the Federal Reserve decided to uh, control inflation with high interest rates. So we had the combination of inflation and then high interest rates, and then the grain embargo, and it, it, it just put it, agriculture into a tailspin. And it took a long time to get out of that, and uh, it took a long time to bring farm values back to where they are. And now we're going through another time, but we don't have the debt that we had back then. Mm -hmm. So it's and a lot better today than it was then, but we still have farm uh, commodity prices are below the cost of production and land values are dropping. And let's jump ahead to 1993, yeah. the floods. 
uh, another crisis that you saw the state through. And when I ask you the highlights of your career, that's something you name. And yeah. even though it was a, a terrible time for the state, um, you were so proud of Iowans and how they responded to that. Well, the worst in times can bring out the best in people. All 99 counties were declared a disaster area. Des Moines lost its waterworks. I think we're the largest city that lost its waterworks. Uh, that happened in the middle of the night. I got a call in the middle of the night says Des Moines Waterworks is going under in the next hour. And we got up at 5 o'clock and we put a strategy together. We had the National Guard distributing water in every supermarket parking lot in Des Moines by noon the next day. We also had National Guard units from other states come in and purify the water for the hospitals. And uh, I remember uh, my father-in-law, uh, along with the president of the AFSCME Union, uh, distributing water uh, to shut-ins around the, the city of Des Moines. And to this day, people still appreciate <laughs> free-flowing water from their faucets and being able to flush their toilets. After right. That. Well, <laughs> and you know, things in life. well, Anheuser Busch uh, canned water for us in beer cans. And we still have some souvenirs of that at the historical building. Yeah, we have some around here somewhere, <laughs> I think, too. Okay, well, when we come back, Governor Branstad honored as the nation's longest-serving governor in history. And he gets a phone call from an ex-president for the occasion when we were there talking to him. We'll talk about that much more when Close Up continues. Branstead represents to us what it means to govern, take responsibility, and manage the system. Branstead represents to us what it means to govern, take responsibility, and manage the system. Bob Woodruff just wanted more than a thousand people in attendance to honor Governor Branstead after he became the nation's longest serving governor in history. And uh, welcome back. CBS's Face the Nation moderator John Dickerson on hand for that gala at the Iowa State Fairgrounds less than two weeks ago. What was that night like for you? Oh, it was surreal. I mean, John Dickerson is a great interviewer. Uh, it was such a relaxed situation. I just was able to, um, you know, share some of the war stories that we've been through in the times that I've served the people of Iowa. And I feel so humble and so honored to have had the opportunity to be selected again and again to serve the people of this state and having led the state back through the, from the farm crisis. And 
you know, it's been uh, quite a journey, and I've really enjoyed it. And I like to say that we're not done yet. I've got a lot of things I want to accomplish. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that in, in the minute. future. Yep. That day, you well, while we were there, you received a call from um, former President uh, George H. W. Bush. What do you right. have to say? Well, he just congratulated me on becoming the longest-serving governor, and mm -hmm. we talked a little bit about uh, the education summit. I, I, had a, I was chairman of the National Governors Association at that time, and I approached him as pre he was a new president. I said, we'd like to have an education meeting with the governors and the president. And he said, he came back to me with the idea of an education summit at Charlottesville, which is the home of the, at the University of Virginia, which is the university that was the, uh, designed by, and the president was uh, uh, the third president of the United States, uh, Thomas Jefferson. And so we had the education summit there. All the members of the cabinet, the president, the vice president, 49 of the 50 governors were there. And that led to the national education goals. Mm -hmm. And I had the honor of then, along with uh, the vice chair, which was Booth Gardner from Washington, and the two governors that I appointed to co-chair the education task force, Bill Clinton from Arkansas and Carol Campbell from South Carolina, we were invited to the White House and traveled in the white, in the, the uh, with the president, actually, to the State of the Union address when he announced the national goals. So that's the only time I've been there for the State of the Union, and we sat with Barbara Bush in, in the balcony with the four governors, and one of those governors uh, became the next president, uh, Bill Clinton. Okay, and just a funny note here. Our producer uh, had to do a little research, and yeah. fun question, has it ever occurred to you that you've pardoned over 30 turkeys in your career? <laughs> you've done some fun things. That, well, you know, my, uh, one of my grandchildren got her picture uh, on the front page of the Wall Street Journal from one of those turkey parties. <laughs> my children loved the... I remember Marcus, when he was little, watching him wobble along chasing the turkey, and the turkey wobbled and he wobbled, and now my grandchildren come for that. It's kind of the highlight of the year for the grandchildren to come to the governor's turkey party. Uh -huh, you seem to have a lot of fun <laughs> with that. Well, when we come back, some final thoughts with Governor Branstead, and we'll ask a question people have wondered about for years. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Close Up This Morning. How about this statistic? In more than 30 years in primaries and general elections as a politician, this man, Governor Terry Branstad, is a perfect 19-0. He has never 
lost. <laughs> Welcome back. We're joined by Governor Terry Branson, the longest serving governor in U.S. history. We've been looking back this morning. That is quite a record. Did you ever come close? Were you ever really nervous? Well, during the farm crisis, 1986 was probably my closest election against Lowell Junkins. I won 52 to 48. Uh, but considering the fact that we closed 38 banks, land values had dropped uh, 63 percent. It was a very stressful and difficult time. But I think people knew that I was working hard every day to diversify the economy, to add value to agriculture products. And so I think uh, um, people stuck with me. Not everybody, but uh, enough that we won in the worst of times. So and the question a lot of people have, did you ever consider running for higher office, for, for the presidency or Congress Senate? Or Senate. Congress. Well, I've been encouraged to many times by different people. But I love Iowa, and I think my experience and knowledge is best served here. And I think governor is the best job. So I really didn't want to go to Washington. I don't mind visiting there, but I didn't want to raise my family there. And uh, I really love this job, and I feel that this is where I can make the biggest difference uh, because of my experience and, and background and, and, and just, uh, you know, the, the more you work at something, the more you get to know the state, I think, the more effective you can be. And you're not done yet. You not done yet. Three more years to go. And I read last night recently that when you finish that term, you all served as governor for 14% of the time that Iowa has been a state. Did you know that? <laughs> well, <laughs> we have a great history. You know, um, Lefty Mills, who was with the Des Moines Register and and, he, and actually did some TV in his later part of his career. He covered, uh, I'll, I'll never forget, he was such a history buff and such an, that he covered a good chair of Iowa's history. So, but anyway, it's been an honor to serve, and we're not done yet. We have more, we want to work on water quality, and we want to continue to uh, implement the improving education and the other things that are on the agenda. Yeah, you're going to have a busy legislative session. I know you're already working on the budget, the budget. today yeah. yes, we are. as we speak. And uh, the book is out, The Iowa's Record-Setting Governor, The Terry Branstead Story. And uh, it's an amazing, interesting look back. And what I love in the end, and, and we have this on our website if you're interested in hearing more about it, is the governor's top ten secrets for success. Thank, Thank you very you. much Thank for you, joining Thank you, Cynthia. Great to be with morning. you. And congratulations again. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.